Hello, everyone, and welcome to Hill Center. Um, I'm Charlotte Oman. I'm actually, I'm Charlotte Harper. Excuse me. Um, I am <laughs> been married a couple years now, but anyway, um, I am the director of programming here. Um, so welcome, and we love to see uh, old faces and new. Is anybody new to Hill Center? Great. Love to see you guys. Welcome from Kensington. Um, we are so happy to welcome you all here. Um, even happier if you silence your cell phones. Um, and I know we are all very cozy in these lovely chairs, but if you donate to Hill Center, we can buy new ones. <laughs> Serious. It's going to be great. They're coming soon. Um, we want to thank uh, Megan Rosenfeld, who has produced this program for gosh, the last few years, I think. Um, it is without her right here. I mean, I'm not going to ask you to stand or anything. Um, but without her, this would be an impossible feat for us. Um, and of course, Bill Press. His continued support means the world to us, invaluable to Hill Center and the community in general. So thank you, Megan. Thank you, Bill. Um, we are honored to welcome Nina, Nina Totenberg, the uh, legal affairs correspondent for NPR, of course, needs no introduction. Um, we are happy to discuss the Supreme Court and its future. I know we are all on pins and needles. Um, but anyway, thank you all for coming, and please continue to support Hill Center, and uh, we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Mm -hmm. Microphone's working. Yes. It's a small enough room, you'd think we could just talk. <laughs> <laughs> good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. It's good to see you for the uh, first Talk of the Hill for uh, 2019. Um, uh, I'm very excited uh, with tonight's program because we all know uh, how important the Supreme Court is. We all want to know what's going on. Uh, and we wanna, when we want to know... Uh, what are the latest cases? How the judges going to go? What did they decide? What does it mean? Um, we all turn to NPR, of course, to find out, and the great Nina Totenberg. Uh, tonight, we have the distinct honor of being able to hear from Nina directly and ask her directly what's going on at the Supreme Court. So we thank you so much for coming to the Hill Center. <laughs> And you know how it works, a half an hour conversation for us, and then we'll have lots more to talk about, but we'll stop there and uh, invite you and your questions for um, uh, Nina Totenberg. Nina, so we did a poll uh, of this group before uh, you arrived to find out the number one question on everybody's mind. Uh, and it was I, can, I know what it was. The number one How's question Ruth on- Ruth Bader Ginsburg? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Exactly. Um, she's doing, as far as I can tell, pretty well. But, uh, you know, she is 85, so she, and she's getting over lung surgery. She's working. I don't think she's doing much except working. I think that's what she's doing is staying home, doing her work, eating, sleeping, and trying to get her strength back. And that's about all I know. Has she been back to the court? No, she is not. I think she initially thought she might be able to. But then she decided that that would not be smart, and I think that probably would not have been smart. Today was a day of breaking news at the Supreme Court. <laughs> I was afraid you might not even be able to make it. So there was so much news. So can we start there? Um, the judges on transgender issues. Let's start with so that. So the first question was: there was a motion from the Solicitor General asking the Supreme Court for two things. It asked the Supreme Court, number one, to um, allow the administration to go forward with its, essentially a ban on transgender personnel in the military, although there's some exceptions. Um, and be, there are a whole bunch of judges in lower courts that had uh, said that the administration had not given a good enough justification for undoing the Obama administration policy that allowed transgenders in the military and that therefore there were a bunch of nationwide injunctions that said you can't implement this new policy of yours. Um, so the Trump administration went to the Supreme Court and it wanted two things. 
it wanted to, the court to say you can start implementing the policy and the court said yes you can start implementing the policy by a five to four vote with the liberals dissenting. Um, and the second thing that the Trump administration wanted was it wanted to leapfrog the normal appeals process and skip the appellate courts, principally the Ninth Circuit. Mm -hmm. And the court said, no, we're not going to do that. But for all practical purposes, this means that for months, if not years, the policy will be implemented until and unless the court rules otherwise. And the fact that there were five justices, all of them conservative justices, who said that uh, the administration could proceed with its policy. You don't usually, um, you don't usually get rid of of a, a lower court injunction unless you think that the side that it, you're siding with has a pretty good chance of winning, has a likely chance of winning. And so I think it's reasonable to assume that five members of this court who have strong records supporting executive authority, particularly in matters related to national security and the military, that they will ultimately sustain this policy if it ever comes to them. That, you know, these, these cases still have to be tried in the lower courts fully and decided by the Ninth Circuit. And it's not terribly important from here on in to the Trump administration because they got what they wanted. So they're not going to mm -hmm. fight this tooth and nail to hurry up. Is this a, con a one concrete evidence of the presence of Brett Kavanaugh and the absence of Anthony Kennedy on a LGBT related issue? It could be. It's possible. But I don't know what Justice Kennedy would have thought about the question of um, what, how he would have viewed the question of discretion in the military as to who can come in and who can't. Uh, after all, it took an act of Congress to allow gays in the military. It wasn't done by the Supreme Court. So I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not 100% sure that it would have made the critical difference, but it might well have. I, I really don't know. Mm -hmm. It's not... It's the it's these other case decided today that definitely will be very different. And the other case was about gun rights. And the court, for the first time in almost uh, a decade, agreed to hear a major gun rights case. And the case is from New York. Uh, New York has a pretty strict ordinance that says you can, um, you can have a license to have a handgun in your home, which is what the court said in... 2008 and 2010 in the Heller and McDonald cases, that you have a constitutional right to have a gun for your own self-defense in your home. And so New York has an ordinance that gives you a license to do that. And you, if you have that license, you're allowed to go to any shooting range in the seven, five boroughs of Manhattan. And there are seven shooting ranges in the five boroughs of Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And you can use your gun there for practice and whatever. But you're not allowed to transport it outside of the city of New York. And so that means that you can't take it to your country bungalow in, the, in, in, Connecticut. in, in Connecticut or even in New York, even in New, New York, York State, State and yeah. let's say in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. um, you, it, let's, it's, if it's not... if it's not your primary residence, you can't take it there. Um, you could keep it in New York State. There are other counties that have different rules, and I presume you could have you could buy two guns and keep one in New York City <laughs> and one in your um, Hudson Valley residence or where you your, your live city, on the week go on the weekends. City gun and your country gun. Um, the people who are challenging it um, view it say it's the most restrictive. Uh, handgun law in the country, and if that's true, and I wouldn't be surprised if it is, um, I would assume that the court will strike it down. Uh, the only question is, how will they strike it down? Will they strike it down and say, you have to give a 
you have to provide for people to be able to carry their guns from their homes to their, from one home to another home within the state or to, uh, I mean, to, I mean, all of the, the rules in the state of New York's in the sit in the city ordinance say if even if you take it to a shooting range it has to be um unloaded and locked so presumably i i'm, I'm assuming this i don't know there is a, a a concealed carry license you could get but i'm assuming that in new york they're somewhat restrictive also so i'm i wouldn't be surprised if the Supreme Court were to strike down this law, even though the lower courts unanimously upheld it. Um, and the question is how? Will they limit it to this, these kinds of very restrictive facts, or will they open the door wide to lots more um, uh, decisions striking down gun regulations and be right. treat gun regulations with great hostility or at least suspicion? And in this case, um, the cases in which the court held that there is a constitutional right to personal, private ownership of a gun in your home for your own self-defense, Justice Scalia wrote that opinion, but the fifth vote was Kennedy, and uh, I was told that as, as a condition of his support, Scalia had to insert a whole section of the opinion, which is considered the most important section of the opinion, at least so far, saying that state and local governments can have reasonable rules regulating gun ownership and gun possession. So uh, that was Kennedy's view very clearly. And presumably they didn't take a major gun case for ten, almost 10 years because the conservatives were pretty sure that Kennedy would not be with them on, on most reasonable gun restrictions. Well, Kennedy's retired now, replaced by Kavanaugh, who has uh, written opinions as a lower court judge in which he treats the Second Amendment much like the First Amendment. He views it as a pretty much very close to absolute Absolutely. right. And so that would mean that a lot of, lot of regulations would fall. So mm -hmm. we're going to see how this all shakes out, and it's a very important case, obviously. Uh, the Congress and the White House are back and forth on the DREAMers program today, and this is also a case where the administration wanted the Supreme Court to leapfrog kind of what they did with mm -hmm. um, the transgender case uh, and the court today? Didn't do anything. It's been sitting on that case for a long time. Um, and I think the court doesn't want to. There is a, a, a nationwide order in place. After all, this is a case where the, the Trump administration dismantled an existing policy. And the question is whether they had the right to do that and in what way and all kinds of things like that. And I think it's such a fraught case politically and generally dreamers are the most sympathetic people in the whole immigration debate. So I don't think the court particularly wants to get into that. So it doesn't do anything. It hasn't it would take five votes to undo the the lower court injunction, and I don't. I I guess there aren't five votes that really want to do that, and they can see that there's a lot of activity going on in the political world. Why should they get into it? Um, meanwhile, they also uh, have the citizenship question on the census case, and they got all but got rid of that case. Because what they, had, what they had agreed to hear was whether the Secretary of Commerce could be deposed on this question um, and whether a cabinet member can be deposed. Sorry, just, to, just to carpet, the question is whether or not um, the Commerce Secretary could add a question to the right. census asking if you are a, a citizen, a of, the citizen of the United States, which and has all, not been on the has not been before. on this on the well, it has it's, it used or, a long sorry, time ago. Long, I think right. I think in the fifties it was, but it has not been on for decades. And all the statistical models show that you you people stop answering census questions when that kind of a question is there, because even though they may be citizens, there may be people in their families who aren't, and they get very suspicious that the information will be used in some way. So uh, 
The court has set argument for February 19th when it gets back from its midwinter break. And um, it, it took it off the calendar this week because the lower court judge issued his decision in the case without Wilbur Ross's deposition. And it's now going to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. But today, the Solicitor General went to the Supreme Court, filed a brief, and said, we have to get this decided by the end of June in order to get it on our census forms, and we want to skip the Second Circuit Court of Appeals and go directly to you now. And we'll see whether the court says, oh yeah, we're just dying to get into that political question too, <laughs> uh, or not. And there, I'm sure there are many people on that court who would just love to get into that question, but we'll see whether they, there are five of them. Um, I don't know. I really don't know. Other Supreme Court related news today, uh, in an interview with the New York Times, um, <coughs> Senator Mitch McConnell said that uh, not scheduling a vote on Merrick Garland or even a hearing on Merrick Garland was, was the most a... consequential thing I have ever done. Well, it probably was. <laughs> uh, and he said that before. And he was very, del I mean, he didn't just not schedule uh, a he not a, a hearing or a vote, he leaned on people to prevent it. Anytime any member of his caucus got up and said, well, I think we really ought to give the guy a hearing or gave any hint like that, um, he would threaten a primary opponent. That happened to Senator Moran in Kansas, who quickly climbed off the, the ledge and went back with his troops. I mean, it's just, um, this is something that Mitch McConnell probably cares more about than anything else as judges. He has been absolutely brilliant and ruthless in pursuit of this goal. And the Democrats have been unbrilliant and unruthless. Mm. And, um, and they are paying the, the consequences now. There was a case, uh, our friend Adam Liptak in the New York Times from the court this morning, uh, not a case that's pending, but a case that the judges have decided to take which is about a new clothing line, uh, which is under the brand, uh, under the slogan of Friends You Can't Trust, or the acronym F-U-C-T, Fucked. Uh, now, how this made it to the Supreme Court is one question. But my question, Nina, is are we really going to hear Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg <laughs> No, you're not. And Sonia Sotomayor no. talk about. I mean, after all, they had the same, essentially the same case a couple of years, a couple of terms ago, which was about this is the, the copyright people have a rule that you can't use. They don't approve of obscene and um, discriminatory and nasty language. They, they don't approve that in copyrights. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be a really consistent way to define those things. So the last time it was the Slants, which was an Asian rock group mm -hmm. that wanted to, they called themselves the Slants and said they were, they were essentially outing themselves, trying to make mainstream this, this <coughs> derogatory term and they, it was a violation of their free speech and the Supreme Court agreed with them. So now comes fucked. What's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, the lower, or I guess the trademark board said that this was not acceptable because it was a phonetic equivalent, I guess, of the Maybe. other fuck. It's, it's <laughs> worth a try. It's worth a try, but I don't think it's going to work. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> right. Uh, there was also a, maybe you could explain, there was a mis there's this mystery case going to the court about some foreign corporation that has something to do with Robert Mueller, but nobody's, <laughs> nobody's talking about what the corporation is, or maybe you know. Well, we don't company. know because everything's under seal. So we do know the court released at least a little more from the briefs, but not much. What we know is that the corporation is sort of synonymous with the country. So let us assume for the sake of argument that it's Russia um, mm -hmm. and it's an oil company or um, something like that. And Mueller subpoenaed their records, the corporation's records, and the company 
went all the way to the Supreme Court trying to quash the subpoena saying it couldn't do that. And the court didn't agree and just got rid of it. So they'll probably come back again and again, but um, so far they have not prevailed. And uh, it's, uh, it's really very difficult. I read the DC circuit opinion, which has so much of it, of the facts blacked out that I can't make head or tail. <laughs> <laughs> And that's deliberative, right? They, well, they don't want but, anybody to, I mean, it's all, it's all secret. It's, it's all grand jury material. And so they can't, it, under federal law, you're not supposed to disclose grand jury material, as long as the grand jury is sitting anyway. How do you rate our judge, because it's so close to them, the, the way the justices get along today with the new, two new members, they're, is there a certain camaraderie that you, that's either there or lacking? And how important is that in their, in their work? Well, I think when you're stuck with each other for life, it's always somewhat important. <laughs> uh, I don't have the sense, you know, Justice Gorsuch had a sort of a tough beginning. Um, he came onto the court in, I think it was March, the first thing that happened was he told the Chief Justice that he wasn't going to be at the first conference because he'd been sworn in like two or three days earlier. This is not unheard of. Mm -hmm. And besides that, he would promise to take his daughter on a college hunting trip, and he wasn't up to snuff on these cases, and the Chief Justice was apparently very put off and said that it was disrespectful of his colleagues. But he didn't do it, and uh, he went with his daughter. And then the next thing, he had a very tough time in the beginning. He was, he was, he would, in, in, the very, in the very first day, there was an incredibly arcane case involving the Merit Systems Protection Board and the layers of review, but when you get to go to federal court. And he made a tactical mistake of saying that this was very simple. All you had to do was read the statute and the Constitution, and you had the answer. And even somebody who was generally uh, on the same page as Gorsuch, in this case, Justice Alito, said, it's not simple. <laughs> 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 so I, th but I sort of sense that he's um, gotten a little more comfortable in his own skin and that other people have tried very hard to not, uh, to make him feel welcome and not, there were the likes of me and other people wrote enough nasty things about him that I think they didn't want him to feel like a like he was being ostracized or hazed by the by the new by the other justices. Is there any sort of left right friendship like there was between Scalia and Ruth Bader Ginsburg among the justices today that you observe? Well, you know, their friendship went back many years to well before they were on the court. Um, even before they were both judges on the D.C. Circuit. Mm. So uh, she knew him and he knew her when they were both at the University of Chicago for some teach. I think he was teaching there. She was a visitor for some brief period of time. And, and they became friends for, at the first then. And then they served for years together on the D.C. Circuit. And... Anybody who knew Justice Scalia, he was a very hard guy not to like. He was, and he made her laugh, as she said often mm -hmm. in public. He made her laugh, and and I went probably the best interview I ever did was an interview of the two of them in Lisner Auditorium, and they were not tired. I, it was I think during the February break. They were not tired. They came to play. I knew them both really well. They teased each other. They laughed about each other and with each other. And they fought respectfully, but they fought about a lot of important things. And I don't think that there's that kind of a relationship between two people on the court today. How about Justice, uh, the Chief Justice? Um, you have written, I think, and others have certainly, that now he is the swing vote. Um, 
What does that mean for John Roberts to be the well, swing Well, John Roberts vote? is a and very conservative judge. So for him to be the swing vote is, you're, 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 you're we're really, in trouble. You're, <laughs> liberals are in trouble. But, but I think he does have a, a very acute sense of his role as chief justice, too acute in the, in the view of some of his colleagues, um, of his role as chief justice and the institutional imperatives of the court. And the chief justice that he most admired was Charles Evan, Evans Hughes. And I, I think this chief justice understands that if they go, if the court becomes, veers very hard right um, and does it quickly, if it does it at all, you know, if mm -hmm. it, and it, it will do it quickly at some point, assuming that you have five members of the court who are very conservative unless he drops off or is able to broker some sorts of compromises. And if he's not, at some point in the future, there will be a Democratic president and there will be both houses of Congress controlled by the Democrats. And when that happens, if the court is viewed by the public as a whole as kind of wacky right, and, and workers and other people think they're not be tre being treated fairly, there will be a push. It's the, you know, all the talk about term limits and all of that, you can forget about it. It's that, those all require a constitutional amendment, and furthermore, they're not gonna happen, and if they did, it wouldn't make a huge difference right away. What would make a huge difference right away is if you packed the court, if you added a couple of justices to the num number of ju judges on the court. And the last president who tried that was FDR and mm -hmm. famously um, lost in his court packing plan. But the numbers of justices on the Supreme Court of the United States has changed 10 times over the course of our history. And almost every one of those times, the, the justices have been added or subtracted if they died and weren't replaced, on, you know, they changed the number for political reasons. And there's no reason on God's good earth that that couldn't happen now. Right, and um, so what should we read into, uh, based on what you just said, about the Chief Justice when um, a judge in California said that the administration rule on asylum, mm -hmm. uh, only granting people, if people had to come into a port of entry if they wanted to seek mm -hmm. asylum. And a judge said, no, that did not hold. Mm -hmm. uh, and justice, and, and the president said, oh, that was an Obama judge. Right. And John Roberts spoke up and said, no, there are no Obama judges or Trump judges, right? That just... Or Bush judges or Clinton judges. Right. And I think he firmly believes that. And I, I, I think that that is more often true than not true. But, and I, at the time, I thought it was appropriate, you know, that he did that. But immediately, you know, I went upstairs at, we know when, when Trump gets off the golf course, and he was at Mar-a-Lago when, when Robert said that. So we know when he gets off the golf course. And the minute he got off the golf course, he started tweeting nasty grams um, <laughs> about this. And the truth is here, if you... If, if you lie down with somebody like that, there is, you do not win, as Marco Rubio learned in the primaries. And so you, I would not expect him to do it again. He mm -hmm. did his one shot. He drew a line. Um, my guess, and it's really only a guess, is that he was infuriated, that he lost his temper. And that having seen hmm. that you can't win this kind of a contest with Trump, he won't do it again. Uh, there are a lot more cases that are pending. I'm sure we've got some questions about some of them. I want to go back to you and how you got started. And <laughs> how did you choose legal affairs? I as didn't your... choose it. I got oh. assigned to it. <laughs> <laughs> and in truth, you know, uh, I always did a lot of other things. I do less, few, I do fewer other things now than cover legal questions and the Supreme Court. But when I started out at NPR, I covered the Supreme Court, the Justice Department, 
all the special prosecutors, the House and Senate Judiciary Committee, and just for kicks, the intelligence community. <laughs> <laughs> now we have about 10 people who do that, those things now. They don't need, uh, nor could I do it in the era of, of multi-platform journalism. There just aren't, there's not enough of me. And when I think about, you mentioned the early days of NPR, you've been with NPR, if I may ask, since? I think we'll skip that. All right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but Writers of a certain age do not like to give hints. That is true. I want to tell you that last this past week was my birthday. Politico wrote and said they would like to feature me as the birthday of the week. <laughs> and I said, but then you're going to say how old I am. So the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. But in those early days, you I, mean, I think of you, uh, Cookie Roberts, mm -hmm. Susan Stenberg, uh, Linda Wertheimer. The founding mothers, really. And we're all still there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and NPR has evolved and grown and... Multiplied by many times over. And, in, you know, I don't think um, we ever imagined that we would be the conservative in the traditional sense of conservative network, that we would be the ones who would be the last to say shithole. Um, <laughs> because first it was decreed that we couldn't say shithole. And then when the world was talking about shithole, then we had to talk about shithole. And Robert Siegel, who had retired the previous week, said it was the, it was just, he was horrified to learn that he had not been able to say shithole because, <laughs> because he had fought so hard to be able to say shithole. And so we brought him back for some other appearance and let him say shithole. <laughs> Knowing Robert well, I'm sure he enjoyed that fully. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I would be the first to say that we do not have a big enough staff to do some of the investigative breaking stories that the Times and the Post do. Uh, but we would have to, we've already doubled the number of White House correspondents we have, and we'd have to double it or triple it again, I think. Post and Times have something like nine or ten reporters on those beats now. Um, but look, overall, looking at coverage of the news, I would have to say that ours is the most reliable, the most consistently fair, and the, the network where you really can hear a diversity of opinion. Now, is it perfect? No, it's not. We probably have more transgender stories than anybody else, and I can't figure out why. <laughs> but, but having said that, it's, if you actually listen to our programs every day, you will hear a lot of things you agree with and a lot of things you don't agree with and a lot of things that you learn. Mm -hmm. Amen. Um, amen. In your time of covering the court, what, what are the couple of decisions that you believe the most, the one that had the most positive impact on the country and the one that had the most negative impact? Hmm. Well, you know, this is rather parochial, but I think the one that had the most positive in impact when I was a young reporter was the Pentagon Papers case. Mm -hmm. And in hindsight, even the government's advocate, the then Solicitor General Erwin Griswold, came to say, eventually to say, there was nothing in those documents that was deserving of, a, of, high, of classification in, a, in any serious way. Um, and if the court had ruled the other way, it would have really dramatically changed what a free press means in the United States. It would have been a lot less free, and the government would have been a lot more powerful. So, although that seems almost like a historical footnote today. I mm -hmm. lived through it, and so it meant a lot to me. Right. Um, the case that, I, I, that concerns me most, although I don't have an easy solution for this, is, is Citizens United, because um, money has flowed into the political system in such rivers that it is enormously influential and it does seem that Congress is almost 
constitutionally, every pun intended, incapable of having at least full disclosure because they get all the money from these people, much of it secretly. Therefore, why are they going to disclose that? Um, they're the beneficiaries of indirectly the money, so and sometimes directly. So I, I, it is the decision that, do I think that McCain-Feingold, for example, would have, without being amended over and over and over, can, continued to plug the various loopholes? No. Um, money is like water in a wooden boat. It'll find a way. But if you keep plugging it up, you will be able to mainly stop it from being too corrosive that, with the emphasis on the two, because it's always going to be beneficial in some ways and corrosive in others. But if you can't do that, and they're really, the court has left us with almost no tools to do that, uh, it's very distressing. And I can't figure out a way to people who say, well, we, we ought to have a constitutional amendment. Okay, tell me what it would say mm, right. that wouldn't curtail all of our rights in a lot of serious ways. It's not so easy. Right. So uh, your question is next, but one final question for me, and that is when we did our poll, the first question was about Justice Ginsburg. The second question that everybody wanted, must ask question is, Tell us about the Stradivarius. <laughs> uh, your father, a concert violinist, and you take it from there. I'll try to be as brief as I can be. So my father was a great concert violinist who died about six or seven years ago at the age of 101, teaching on his deathbed, literally. And he made his debut as a soloist at the age of 11 with the Warsaw Philharmonic. And I think his last concert, he was 93, his last recital. Um, and he, until 1980, played a Stradivarius violin that he had bought in 1943. Um, and it was, as he put it, his dancing partner. And um, in 1980, he gave a concert in Boston, and it was stolen from his dressing room slash office and not recovered in his lifetime. And he used to often say, people would say, Professor Tobenberg, do you think your violin will ever be found? And he said, he would say, after I have kicked the bucket. <laughs> um, well, it was pretty much true. Uh, two years, I guess it is, after he, maybe four years after he died, um, I got a call one morning from the FBI, from the art, from the art section in New York. And special agent Christopher McKeo said to me, Ms. Totenberg, we think we found your father's violin. And, but we don't want you to tell anybody about it till we figure everything out. And I had all these ideas about how the mob had stolen it or whatever. <laughs> um, but in fact, it was the person my father had always thought had stolen it. One of it. his students, right? No, oh, okay. he wasn't one of his students, but he did know him. Mm -hmm. And um, he was in a, a kid in his early 20s who, he, who had been at the concert carrying a violin case that was empty. And so he, what he did was he went in, picked up the violin and a tort bow, put it in the violin case, and left. Um, and my father bought another violin. He bought a Guarneri violin that was, he played very happily for the rest of his life after he relearned the entire repertoire because the fingering was an entirely different because the Strad was much bigger than the Guarneri. Um, but when it was found, we were all, my sisters and I were so thrilled and we really, they had, we had a press conference in New York at the Southern District of New York um, when they turned the violin over to us, and there were more layers of law enforcement there claiming credit for this, <laughs> from, the N from the NYPD to an assistant director of the FBI. And in truth, what happened was that the guy who stole it died of pancreatic cancer at age 58. He, his wife, ex-wife, on whom he had cheated constantly, took him in at the end of his life to take care of him. And he left two violins with her. 
and one of them had a, a combination lock. And after he died, maybe a year or two later, she, with her boyfriend, busted open the, the case. And it said, it was a Stradivari, it said it's, you know, made by Antonio Stradivari in the years 1734 in the city of Cremona, Italy. But she knew enough to know that there are tens of thousands of violins that say things like that in them. And she took it to an appraiser in New York. She met him at a hotel in New York with her boyfriend. And he looked at her and he said, well, I've got good news for you and I've got bad news for you. The good news is it's a real Stradivarius and the bad news is it belongs to Roman Totenberg because it was stolen from him 35 years ago and it's a well-known instrument. And by then my dad had died. Um, and so he said, I have to call the FBI now. And he did. And Agent Mikio and his partner were there 25 minutes later. Wow. And they went through this thing, okay, you know, literally centimeter by centimeter, 17 centimeters from this to that, check. So, you know, it's, and, and they took the violin. And when he called me, he said to me, do you know any, we've had it appraised now by two people, um, looked at by two people, but is there anything else you can tell me about it? I said, well, the tuning pegs have mother of pearl inlays in them. And he said, well, I mean, look, it's sitting here on my desk. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever laid eyes on. And he said, and it, they have mother of pearl inlays. And um, so that's the, it, so it was returned to us. It took two years to restore it because he had, it had some things that he had done, you know, that there was a crack and, right at the top when, where the neck goes into the violin. There was a little crack and some other things and they literally took it apart. So I, my husband has pictures, I can't bear to look at them, of it in total pieces where the front oh. and the back are separate and the, they're both on molds that have been made of it so that they don't lose their shape. So they would do just a little bit and then wait for a month. And so it was restored and then f we finally sold it this year. We could have sold it for a great deal more money if we were willing to have it go to someplace in Asia probably. But we wanted to, it to be somewhere where we could hear it and see it and, and that it would be played by other great artists. And as luck would have it, um, one of the benefactors of arts in New York said to the dealers who were handling the sale and who did the restoration, he said, he gave them a challenge and he said, I will buy this violin and lend it for years at a time to young artists. If you will find other people to do the same with some of the other instruments you have for sale. And so they started this thing called the Rare Violins Consortium and the first person to play it is a young man named Nathan uh, Mel Meltzer, who's 18 years old and has already got gigs all over the world and is at Juilliard. And we, we had a little press conference when we lent it to him. And he, and he plays just beautifully. He plays like my dad. And, um, and whenever he travels, his father goes with him, not as an escort for him, but as an escort for the violin. We would love to entertain your questions. Um, we have two microphones here and here. Yes, and let's start over here, Brian, please. Uh, with the ad stage adaptation of To Kill a Mockingbird uh, in mind, I wondered what you think are some of the best dramatic presentations of the way the law works, not necessarily <coughs> trial uh, dramas, but uh, just legal representations in dramatic form. Well, I think trial dramas are the best representations. And the reason is that appellate cases are really boring uh, drama. Uh, there have been at least three or four Supreme Court TV series that all just lasted a nanosecond. They were so, they were both ridiculous and 
not good, not good enough drama. It's very hard to do that. Um, and so I think that trials are the best um, dramatization of both the, the victories and the terrible injustices that can be wrought by the law. Have you seen the new uh, Kill a Mockingbird? I'm sorry. Well, for example, there was that wonderful, I can't remember the name of it, movie that um, starred um, Newman in it. That um, hmm? The Verdict. The Verdict is a great movie. And it does show you how easily um, a ca that case if they, it, people find things all the times in cases at the very last moment. There was a, a death penalty case a few years ago in the Supreme Court, and I, I, I couldn't do a story on it that night because there was too much else that the court did. Justice Ginsburg wrote a dissenting opinion, and so I tracked down the lawyers who were from some white shoe firm in Philadelphia that had represented this guy on death row in Louisiana. And um, they had lost every appeal possible, and they lost um, in the Supreme Court too. Uh, but they they were they they were on their way to tell him that there was nothing more they could do for him. When somebody, one of their investigators, found someone who had a document that just changed everything, and showed that he'd been essentially framed. Um, I don't know that he was framed by the prosecutors, but they didn't want to undo it. Let's put it that way. Should we go? Oh. I, I don't need, I don't need that, oh. Uh, uh, you got it. Uh, I got one, though. Yeah. Uh, so, Nina, thanks for, for being here. I mean, as uh, as somebody who grew up in a household where uh, mass wasn't the most important thing on Sunday morning, but it was Meet the Press and Inside Washington, the McLaughlin group, um, and I, I, you, you, helped, you helped raise me. Uh, so I guess my, qu my question is, as uh, kind of a, a veteran of that, of that, of that circuit, what's, what's wrong with it now? Is it just the, uh, the polarization or a, a inability to live up to the kind of uh, new media, or am I just curmudgeonly now? <laughs> Well, it's a little bit of everything. I mean, we can't, I would love to go back to, in terms of news, to the way it was when I started out, um, but that you can't, you can't put that genie back in the bottle. And there are, you know, multiple cable news stations. They're all fighting for another, for a little piece of the pie, along with the commercial networks, the, the, the broadcast over the, over the, the old-fashioned broadcast networks that are not cable, and um, they're all fighting for survival in terms of news, and not to mention dominance, and the way to do that is, in the modern world we live in, is not particularly calm or respectful discussion. <laughs> um, you know, when, when I was very young, before I ever was a reporter, uh, shows like Meet the Press were the first time people got to see newsmakers discussing an issue. And it was extremely respectful. And, I, and by today's standards, unbelievably dull. <laughs> but, but people actually said something, too, a great deal of the time. And today, the, the, the meme of the way we live is talking points. And I don't know about you, but I can't stand them. When I, even on my own network, when I hear somebody live, and I can almost literally hear him or her reading off the page the talking points, I just can't bear it. Um, and I click it off, uh, but it's what politics today is. 
and too often reflected in the media. I think, huh? Yes. Um, while we have the mic over here, not ignoring this side that these hands shot up. Yes. Uh, the change of the uh, filibuster rule for Supreme Court justices from 60 down to 50, done by um, Mitch McConnell. You know, the Democrats had changed it for everybody but the Chief Justice uh, or the Supreme Court justices. Do you think that change uh, resulted in getting both Gorsuch uh, and Kavanaugh confirmed? Or would they have been confirmed without it? And do you think that it ought to be changed back to 60 votes so that you get a broader consensus of who should Dream vote? on. You, that's like asking people to disarm unilaterally. That's what the Democrats would say to you. Um, I, I think they would not have been confirmed if there had been, um, if there still were the filibuster rule. But um, there is no doubt in my mind that that even if the Democrats had not done what they did, that Mitch McConnell would have changed the filibuster rules for judges. Period because that was the way that he, this is what he, this, is, this presidency was his chance. And, um, and he took it. And I don't for a moment think that if uh, Harry Reid hadn't in desperation at the end of the Obama administration managed to finally change the rule um, for lower court judges, uh, if if it were if he'd never done that, I am pretty sure that Mitch McConnell would have changed the rule. And the the best evidence of that is that enough of the old bulls on the Democratic side didn't want to really didn't really want to change the rule, and and neither did some of the old bull Republicans like McCain. McCain went to McConnell and carried a proposal from. The Democrats and from Harry Reid that said, if you, that this came to a head when there were three openings on the DC circuit and Obama named three people to the DC circuit and um, the Republicans were filibustering all three of them and the Democrats said, we're going to change the rule because this, you're just, you're just blocking everybody we have. And so, but they, had a proposal, they said, which they gave to McCain to carry to McConnell, which was, and to the Republican caucus, which was, if you'll approve one of the three, we will not change the rule. And McCain brought it to the Republican caucus and they all said, no. So if you really wanted to maintain the rule, there was a way to do it. And some people did want to maintain the rule, but I don't think it was a, a majority of the Democrats or the Republicans. Assuming long life for the four liberal judges, if you will, is it likely in the next two years that we could see a resignation of one of the those on the right in order to give Trump a third appointment? No, I don't think so. Clarence he, Thomas? No, I don't think so. If Clarence Thomas retires, he'll do it because he wants to retire. Um, it, he will not do it, to, I don't think, to give Trump another appointment. These people are really very loyal to this institution and to themselves. And they think they do their job quite well. And they're not inclined to say, oh, well, somebody younger than me, well, we should give him his or her, that person <laughs> should have their shot. Um, the, the, it's, I, you know, the, the only time I, Byron White, was going to retire. Mm -hmm. He waited to retire until there was a Demo until Bill Clinton was in office. But if Bill Clinton had not been elected, he would have retired. He waited because he wanted there to be a Democrat, but he wasn't going to wait eight more years. <laughs> right. A question here? Yes. Your coverage of Anita Hill um, was one of the most important parts of me kind of realizing that there was news outside of my elementary school uh, playground. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for that. Um, and in listening to the Kavanaugh hearings, I was just wondering how that was personally for you, having broken the story of Anita Hill, if that was difficult, um, and how, in general, how that experience was. 
Well, I'm now about to re reveal to you, in some sense, what a venal person I am. <laughs> it wasn't that difficult. It was a, too good a story to be that difficult. <laughs> um, but I, I did, you know, on the day that uh, Christine Blasey Ford testified and everybody was saying, well, Kavanaugh is, is toast, I, all I could do was think that people thought that at the, after Anita Hill testified too, and it, and it turned out not to be true. Um, the White House was very tough about sticking with it and, and trying to get First Thomas through and succeeding um, and doing the same with Kavanaugh. And they had McConnell to help. And uh, I was not surprised that the, the whole narrative turned quite a bit. And I was not surprised that it was um, such a partisan vote either. Uh, it was a, a lot of, it seemed deja vu all over mm -hmm. again, right? Mm -hmm. To some was, extent, you know, it was, I was very, I was sort of just amazed. One, on all things considered, one night they had Hank Brown, former senator from Colorado on, who'd been on the Judiciary Committee when, during the, during the Hill-Thomas hearings. And he said repeatedly that, there were, really was no corroborative evidence from Christine Blasey Ford, and there wasn't a lot. Um, that there was so much more evidence in t for in, in, to corroborate Anita Hill, Anita Hill's testimony, and that she had so much more, so many more people that she told and um, contemporaneously, and who recalled it, and who were willing to come forward, and she knew where everything had occurred, and she could recite chapter and verse of what had happened, and, um, and then he got off the air. But he voted to confirm Clarence Thomas. So everybody's brains just sort of recycle things the way they want them to be recycled. <laughs> As always, a question here, please. Yeah. Hi, this is just curiosity. I have never seen anything in print about a spouse of a justice before this year, and I suppose Mrs. Thomas is out outcoming, whatever she was doing, but there was a big expose about her opinions and the justice saying that he relied on her and her opinions for so much of his thinking and his own positions. Are, do you interact with the spouses? I mean, do you have occasion to see their opinions or? I'm, I found well, this just she, fascinating. She, she has a long history of being very active in political conservative circles. So, she was one of the top legislative aides for Dick Armey when he was the Republican leader of the House. Um, she ha campaigned vociferously against the ACA, uh, the Affordable Care Act. I mean, Ginny Thomas, is, it, is, it is not a secret. Her views are not a secret. Now, some people have spouses whose views are, frankly, a little nutty, and they're not. Um, <laughs> and I, I, you know, I have no idea how much influence she really has in his formulation of views. Uh, but in, in the, and I suspect deeply that at some point she took a, a less uh, visible job. And I think probably at her husband's request, and I would not be surprised if that had been at the suggestion of the Chief Justice, that this sort of makes people question his views. Uh, but I, the other spouses, as far as I know, are not politically active. I'm sure they have political views. We all have political views. Um, I guarantee you my husband has political views, <laughs> and I do not always share them. <laughs> what is your, I'm curious, what, what level of access, access do you have to the justices? Are they all equally accessible? I doubt it. No, and, but it, it, this is one of those times when a pace who've been around a long time. So you know people when they're coming up. I knew Steve Breyer when he was Ted Kennedy's um, counsel on the Senate Judiciary Committee. I, I knew Justice Scalia when he was on the D.C. Circuit. I took him once to the White House Correspondences. Association dinner when he was on the D.C. Circuit. Hmm. Um, I knew uh, I knew Kavanaugh when he was not even on the D.C. Circuit. Um, 
<laughs> not high school. <laughs> um, so, you know, I knew Ruth Ginsburg when she was uh, arguing cases in front of the Supreme Court. So, uh, if you know people before they become a justice, it's very advantageous in terms of knowing them well enough to have some access to them. But it's not access like you have to political figures because they can't talk about anything that's before the court. They can't. I wouldn't ask them. They wouldn't talk to me at all. I wouldn't have any sense of who they are as human beings if I were to ask that kind of a question because they wouldn't answer it. That must be very limiting, right? I mean, it is extremely limiting. Right. It is extreme. You really do, when you cover the court, to a large extent, you are basing your day-to-day -day reportage on what the court does, not on who they are. What a great evening. We are so happy to have you where you are, and happy to have you here tonight. Well, thank you thank for you. having me. Okay. So stay tuned for, uh, we're work Megan and I are working on a couple of very exciting people. We can't announce yet, but uh, we'll see you in February and March and beyond. Are you having, are you having fun? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Somehow, I, I think the, the political bent of this crowd is, might not be too, ter too terribly the, bent. If he came here, he might learn a few things, but I, that's why he won't come. I don't think so. Okay. All right. Good evening, everybody. Thank you.